Hello, my name is Eamon Ferguson and I'm Professor of Health Psychology at the University of Nottingham. And for the past 25 years or so, I've been actively involved in studying both blood and organ donor behaviour. So it's a real honour and a privilege to have been asked by Barbara and her team to give a talk in this series of talks over a week organised as part of the DAWN network. In this talk, I want to describe how studying blood donor and organ donor behaviour not only allows us to help patients and understand better ways to recruit both blood and organ donors, but also gives us some insights into understanding the nature of human cooperation. And therefore, by studying blood and organ donor behaviour, we can help patients, donors and feedback into the academic community. So this slide provides a basic conceptual overview of the talk I wish to give today. So blood and organ donation are traditionally viewed as acts of altruism or cooperation. Therefore, if we want to understand blood and donor behaviour, then drawing on theories from economics, biology and psychology that are specifically designed to understand cooperation should not only inform us of what motivates blood donors and help therefore lead to better design and intervention ideas, but may also highlight new concepts. And one that I will talk about today is reluctant altruism that can feed back into the literature theoretical literature that is on altruism and cooperation. So we have this duality by studying blood and organ donors, we can understand, you apply these theories to understand what is motivating them and that can inform interventions, but we can also feed back into the wider theoretical literature as well. In this slide I want to show the conceptual linkage between the study of blood and organ donation and the theories from altruism and cooperation that that study allows us to test as well as the economic gains using the lab to test theories of um, cooperation altruism for which blood and organ donation are direct analogues. So for example, we've got um, blood donation to a stranger, yeah. organ, blood donation to family, organ donation to a stranger, an organ donation to either a stranger or a family in terms of living donation. When we look at the familial donation, for example, it allows us to specifically test theories of inclusive fitness, so people's preference to differentially give to family and kin over strangers. Okay. Blood donation, when it's to a stranger, allows us to test one of the most basic assumptions of human cooperation and altruism, that is giving high cost helping to a stranger. Okay which in the lab is done in a dictator game where an individual player one has some resource they can give to a player two. It is also a model of the public goods game where people can give, but yet everybody can share the resources even if they haven't given. And then for organ donation, that's the case when we're looking at opt-in donation. When we've got an opt-out organ donation system, we're modeling a resource dilemma. There is a resource that's available to everybody because now everybody's opted in as an organ donor, but people can defect or opt out, in which case they're taking the resource away. In the familial context, we're modeling a full prisoner's dilemma or a social dilemma where people can choose to cooperate with each other for a mutual beneficial outcome or they can defect, in which case the outcome is less satisfactory or, or not attained at all. And we've got the ultimatum game here, where one person can give some resource, this person here, give some resource to a second person, the second person then chooses to accept the division offered, and if they accept it, they both get the offer, and if it's rejected, neither of them get it. So we can see studying blood and organ donation allows us to directly test these theories, and the games used to test those theories in the lab are direct analogue of blood and organ donation in the real world. Very quickly on this slide, I just want to point out that the term altruism doesn't really apply to blood and organ donation when we're thinking about it here in terms of donating to a stranger. They are actually described as mutually beneficial acts of cooperation because essentially both the donor and the recipient are gaining. So the pluses here mean a behaviour that benefits the recipient or the donor and a negative behaviour that harms the recipient or the donor. And we've got lifetime fitness, so 
increase in somebody's fecundity over a lifetime or an immediate fitness and immediate health benefit. So we're actually dealing with theories of cooperation and, self and mutually beneficial behaviour. Under an opt-out system, when somebody decides, the donor decides to leave the register, that has a benefit to the donor, but as a negative effect on the recipient, that would be a selfish behaviour. So not the full um, dilemma, social dilemma, is not apparent when we're dealing with a stranger situation, but it is when we're dealing with the familial situation, which makes it a unique case to study both cooperation as well as exploitation. I'm going to be talking today primarily about the stranger context rather than the familial, but I include this here so you get a sense of the, how blood and organ donation can be used to test theories widely, and when you put it into a game theoretic framework like this, how it gives you a way of thinking about what the terms are we're using and how to test those. Okay, so what have we learned new about cooperation from studying blood and organ donors? So one of the key problems facing cooperation is that of the free rider problem. So from an evolutionary perspective, the free rider should always win. So somebody who decides not to contribute to the public good, but knows that they will benefit from the public good, so if everybody else is contributing, they will benefit. Then from an evolutionary perspective, they should be surviving because they're not paying any cost in terms of contribution costs, but they're getting the benefits in terms of um, re uh, the, the rewards that come from a, a shared resource. So traditionally in the literature, what you see is over time, you get this what's called the public goods decay curve. People stop contributing and helping. But if we introduce a punishment, so people who don't contribute are punished, we see cooperation increases. Also, observe, this is the conditional cooperation effect. If your own contribution here is directly proportional, the red line here, to the amount that other people give. So if you know what, on average what other people are doing, it's likely to increase your own cooperation levels. Or we can go societal level, we can have an change the default from, say, as done in organ donation, from opt-in to opt-out. So these are the traditional ways of trying to deal with um, or understand the free rider problem and intervene. Obviously, we can't punish people for not being an organ donor or a, or a blood donor. So it may not be as applicable within this context. And what we found recently in a study with colleagues at, at Sanguine, with an analysis of uh, the Donor Insight Survey, uh, psychometric analysis of the questions in there, we identify what we call reluctant altruism. Uh, I will call it now reactive reluctant altruism, and you'll see why in a moment. And this was the idea that blood donors, especially blood donors in that early stage of their career, so new or novice donors, were donating blood because they didn't trust other people to donate. So there's this lack of trust that others are going to do this worthy cooperative behaviour, and that motivated um, people towards cooperation. This is of particular interest because normally, as you've seen from the previous slide, it's trust that others are going to cooperate that drives people towards cooperation. It's that shared sense of uh, working together. Whereas here, in the face of high free riding that is seen in blood donation, only three to four percent of the population actually donating blood, we see it's the lack of trust that's driving people towards um, wanting to cooperate. And we've recently developed this to show that there's also a moral anger component to this. So people are angry because other people are not helping. And a view about society is an uncaring society. And these together drive people towards making their initial donation or their initial um, contribution. Okay, what we see in this slide is two conceptualizations of this notion of um, reluctant altruism. The one that I've just described, which is a reactive reluctant altruism, which we've identified in the blood donor research, where here the social pressure is towards free riding and the person wants to help, so now they help, so they can't trust other people. Subsequently to this, within the economics literature, there's been a notion of, of reluctant altruism, which we term the coerced reluctant altruism, where here the social pressure is to cooperate and people cooperate even though they don't want to help. So here they are what's known as giving in rather than giving. So if you want to help and the social pressure is to cooperate, then you then you give. Okay. So we've got these two very, very different notions of reluctant altruism. The one that we've identified, which is the idea that when the social pressure is to free ride 
as we might see in an opt-in system under organ donation or blood donation. Then there's a group of people who actively want to help because they don't trust others. However, when we've got a situation where there's one of cooperation, which you might see under an opt-out organ donation system, for instance, then there are people who may feel socially pressured to be involved and they don't want to be involved. And they're both reluctant altruists. This one is reactive. They're reacting against the free riding. This one is coerced. They're reacting against social pressure to be involved. Recently, we documented and described what we have called lone wolf defectors and good shepherd cooperators. And what motivated this was the idea that default settings set up injunctive norms. So if we take the organ donation opt out default, that sets up the injunctive norm to cooperate. Everybody's on the register and then people can choose to defect and leave. Whereas the opt in default sets up a free riding injunctive norm in the fact that people are not on the register and have to opt in. What we were particularly interested in is what if people act in contravention of those um, cooperative defaults or injunctive norms. So if somebody defects under the opt out system or cooperates under the opt in system. And we're particularly interested in the role of feedback here. So we're interested in the idea that in the modern world, people can tell people immediately if they're signing on a register or if they are defected from the register using social media. So we're interested in what happens if people can immediately update their status and let people know, which is with individualistic feedback, what their current decision is and if they've changed it or without that feedback, which is the more similar situation that you see in public health messaging. And what we see under an opt-in system, when people can feedback, we get a high level, higher level of registration. But when we move to opt out with feedback, the registration levels drop. So when people can witness other people leaving the system, that's a strong social force for them to follow suit and leave. And as you see here, Indeed, under opt out with feedback, we have the lowest registration rate due to the lone wolf defectors. And under opt in, we have the highest registration rate, but no difference across the two. So this is a lab based economic game that we developed. That's an analog of real world organ donation. People were making organ donor decisions within a game theoretical framework. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it shows quite clearly that if in the presence of feedback, people start to see people opting out. This could be detrimental for organ donor donor registrations. Okay, and it shows a nice interaction between defaults and how defaults are influenced, how people interpret the behaviour of others, either defecting the lone wolves or cooperating the good shepherds. I okay, say so. How can we test models of cooperation using um, blood and organ donors? I'm going to give one example here, which is the example from sexual selection. So here we know that blood donors are fit and healthy people. They're free from infection and also they're kind, caring and brave. So in terms of mate selection, they're a great costly signal. They're showing that, the, the, you know, if you're thinking of somebody to have children with, then a blood donor will be a good person to choose. They're, they're healthy, they're fit, they're kind, they're strong. So we tested some predictions from cost of signal theory, again, using the um, insight data set from um, Sanguine in Holland. And what we looked at here was across different age categories, through from young through the reproductive years to the later, less reproductive years, we looked at the extent to which people told other people they were a blood donor and whether they had children or not. The prediction, which you can see is borne out in this graph, is essentially people, are, if blood donation is a costly signal for mate choice, so knowing that somebody is a blood donor is going to make them more attractive, they should want to tell people they're more attractive. And if it's about getting your genes in the gene pool, which is again what costly signaling theory is telling us, you should do that more when you haven't got children and when it's in your reproductive years. That's exactly what we see. So the blood donation context, because blood donation is such a good example of a costly signal in humans, gives us a unique opportunity to test that theory. And the evidence supports it very, very strongly. We then took that into the lab and we asked people to tell us when they would tell somebody whether they were single, childless, a non-smoke, had a sense of humour, their age, all things which are seen as attractive to a, a mate, 
and whether they were a blood donor, whether they did this when they were trying to make a platonic friend or try to start a romantic relationship. And again, we see for all the standard economic, I'm sorry, um, markers of costly signals here, they're higher in the romantic relationship. And this is also the case for blood donation. So again, we have lab-based evidence that blood donation may be a costly signal for innate attraction. And this can be turned nicely then into interventions with signals that I'm a blood donor, which could just be a badge. And as Barbara and her team have recently shown, a very useful way to do this is to have a bandage, but with a, with a logo on, which signals that the person is an, a nice, kind and altruistic person. So what have we learned about donors and what are the implications for interventions? So one of the first things we can say we've learned about blood donors is they're more sensitive to violations of norms of fairness. We show this in the lab in using the ultimatum game. Here in the ultimatum game, a person, a donor, can offer some money to a recipient who then decides to accept it or reject it. If they reject it, they both get zero. If they accept it, they get whatever they offer the first person made is. And what is seen in the literature is basically as those offers become increasingly unfair, people are more likely to reject the offer and both people get nothing, they're less likely to accept it. And we can see that this is much more apparent for donors. You see that here across the offers and here as the average. The idea that people are rejecting the offer that's unfair as a way of signaling to the person who's made the offer to be fair in the future. So this idea of fairness can be embodied in a voluntary reciprocal altruism um, type of intervention idea. So here the idea is people are asked if they would want to accept, they'd want a transfusion or would accept a transfusion to save their life. And by thinking about that, they have to think about where blood comes from, that other people must be donating, and therefore for the people donating, it's only fair that they should reciprocate and donate as well. So does it there's, there's a fairness component in here. Then if they're asked if they'd be willing to donate, it raises the idea, well, they, they ought to donate now because it's only fair they should. But also, if other people are choosing not to, it could imply shortages, which may activate this notion of reluctant altruism as well. So along with Barbara and um, Abby, we ran a series of experiments where we tested this in non-donors. So here, VRA is voluntary reciprocal altruism. And what we see here for both a one-off and repeat donation intentions or willingness, we see that VRA um, idea of asking people, would they accept a donation and would they be willing to donate is a strong predictor of people's decisions to say they would make a one-off or repeat donation. When we split it down to its components, it's the acceptance question. Would you accept a transfusion that seems to be driving the effect. We also compared it, the acceptance question to a standard question behavior intentions question, because often there's an argument by asking people if they intend to donate that is sufficient to motivate donation. And again, we see that the acceptance question increases significantly compared to the other conditions, people's willingness to make a one-off or a repeat donation. So if this is quite strong evidence a simple intervention asking people they'd be willing to accept a transfusion may be a strong way to motivate people to initially donate. One way to think about an underlying principle for fairness is that of inequality aversion. This is the idea that people are averse to inequality and are motivated to do something to reduce that inequality. This can be modelled in a third party punishment and recompensation game, which is described in this diagram here. Here, somebody makes an unfair offer to somebody else. And the third party can choose to compensate the victim or punish the perpetrator or do both or do nothing. And it's set up to be um, demonstrate inequality aversion in terms of the amount of money they can either use to compensate or punish. In our case, I won't go into the details, it was set up such if they um, compensate at the level of £1.50 or punished at the level of £1.50, that would show a motivation towards um, inequality aversion. And as we can see, apart from punishment, that's essentially what we get here. And interestingly, in terms of choices, we see that blood donors had a preference towards compensation and organ donors as a preference towards punishment. That's interesting for two reasons. One, 
it shows that basically blood donors are focused on helping an individual and secondly it shows that organ donation people who are on the organ donor registry are thinking more about having a resource it's there for everybody punishment is seen as a way of instilling norms generally whereas compensation is seen as looking at fairness norms which are directed at an individual we can translate this idea of inequality aversion into um, an intervention which is based on the idea of advantageous inequality aversion so here the blood donor has an advantageous inequality they have greater health hence they can be a blood donor than the person the patient they are helping or their blood is like to help so blood becomes the commodity to which the quality of health can be redistributed. So we compared a control condition to an advantageous inequality aversion message as a healthy person, you can give blood to help those less healthy than you, versus an anticipatory guilt question, um, message. If people like you do not donate blood, there will be a continuing shortages in the future. And what we see for non donors is in terms of collecting additional information to go on and become a blood donor, we see both the anticipatory guilt and the inequality version lead to an increased uptake. But for donors, we see that the anticipatory guilt leads to a reduction and the um, advantageous inequality, um, message, inequality aversion message an increase. We also looked at um, whether people found these messages manipulative and the levels of guilt. And essentially, people find the advantageous inequality message as one that engenders guilt, but guilt that motivates them and is non-manipulative, whereas the anticipatory guilt is seen as, as manipulative. So overall, a message based on advantageous inequality version could be very beneficial, again, in motivating non-donors, and having but having no detrimental effect on donors. The second thing we can say is that blood donors, and in particular experienced blood donors, are warm glow givers. That is, they are motivated to cooperate by the positive self-regard and feelings they get from the act of cooperation itself. And we can show this quite nicely in the lab setting using what's called a charity dictator game. Here, the person, donor or non-donor, has some money and can decide how much to give to a charity of their choice. Here in the charity dictator game, the donor may feel warm glow from the act of giving and also the charity benefits in terms of gaining money. We can turn that into a, a warm glow version of the charity dictator game by what's called crowding out their contribution. So here we can say to the donor, tell us which charity you prefer and we get the name of the charity. We say, OK, we're going to give that charity, say, five pounds. Then we say to the person, you can donate some of your money to that charity if you wish, but whatever you donate, we will remove the equivalent amount from the amount we have donated. So, for instance, if they wish to donate two pounds to the charity, we will remove two of our five pounds. So the charity can only ever have five pounds, so the charity cannot gain financially. So the only motivation to give under these contexts could be the should be the warm glow of giving. And what we see under standard charity dictator game is that blood donors give significantly less than non-donors. Both are being very charitable. The maximum here they could give is 10, but donors are slightly less. But, but we get a complete flip over when it comes to warm glow version. And here, the blood donors give significantly more when the primary motivation for giving is warm glow. We've shown that warm glow is a predictor psychometrically in field studies. And along with colleagues in Australia, with Barbara and with um, Tanya and people at the Australian um, Red Cross uh, Lifeblood, we've been developing a theory and testing it in a set of field studies and lab based studies. With basically the idea is that donors are recruited, and then from the act of donation, they'll either feel warm glow, they'll be what we call warm donors, or they'll feel less warm glow, and we'll call those cool donors. And that, that notion of warm glow motivates them to rebook, which facilitates repeat donation because it takes away having to remember, it stops derailing. But also that warm glow remains high and that high level of warm glow facilitates the, the probability of repeat donation. So initial warm glow acts to set a chain reaction in place of rebooking and high levels of warm glow, which lead to repeat donation. For the cool donors, 
that's less likely to happen. So one thing we can do with call donors is intervene in some way, okay? Send them some message which enhances their warm glow, which will increase their probability of returning to donate. In support of this theory, we've been able to show that anticipated warm glow and experienced warm glow both predict or are associated with people's tendency to rebook, such that people with high levels of warm glow are more likely to rebook. And we've also been able to show that warm glow is predicted by actual rebooking, but doesn't vary over time. It remains stable across time. So two of those components of the model that warm glow facilitates return donation through rebooking and that it's stable over time, which in itself may facilitate actual attendance, both are supported in the data we've collected so far. We also ran a large scale field based um, RCT where we compared it or exposed first time donors were either exposed randomly to a warm glow message to said you will you're basking the warm glow that comes from donating blood or a warm glow plus identity message. I wanted to get the idea as warm glow is more important for people who are experienced donors. We wanted to give people the notion of the identity of the donor. So this was done with about six weeks ago was a day you became a blood donor. And we compared these to what's known as impure altruism messages, which focus both on the donor's warm glow and actually the contribution to the public good, the contribution to helping the recipient. Again, with and without an identity manipulation. And what we find in these studies on this field based RCT is that the warm glow plus identity positively predicted attendance three months later, as did rebooking. But that there was an interaction between rebooking status and warm glow identity message. And this interaction was of the form that basically people, donors, first time donors who had not rebooked, those who were exposed to the warm glow plus identity message were more likely to attend to donate three months later. So those donors who were cool, those donors who hadn't rebooked, were more likely to return. So we argue that this basically warm glow message acts as a boost to their emotional warm glow which is enough to facilitate them actually then turning up to donate subsequently. We then looked at this in an implementation trial. So that warm glow plus identity message then became implemented as a business as usual um, intervention within um, the Australian Red Cross Lifeblood. And what we basically see here, we've got these bars here and here are post implementation and the orange bar is pre and we can see for those that rebooked there is no real effect of that message however for those who didn't rebook from pre to the post side here we see an increase that's about a seven percent increase um, in the number of uh, people who didn't rebook who are now re who are now attending to donate as a function of that message so the theory is supported. Warm glow particularly seems to be important both in terms of facilitating return donation, but also it can be boosted in those that don't rebook to increase the number of um, people donating who had the lower probability of um, returning in the first place. So what have we learned about theories of cooperation from our studies of blood and organ donors? I think what we have learned can be summarised in this simple little diagram here. So in the face of free riding, when most people are not cooperating, then trust, reciprocity, fairness, and reactive reluctant altruism are enough to motivate people into the actual cooperative behavior, in this case, blood donation. Those who feel warm glow from donation are more likely to return. So warm glow becomes a glue, if you like, that sustains and reinforces repeat high cost cooperation. Those who don't feel high levels of warm glow are more likely to exit. But we know that they can be remotivated or rewarmed to come back in to the system through a simple intervention. So one of the dilemmas for high cost cooperation or understanding it is why do people start cooperating and what maintains it? And I think from the study of blood and organ donation, we move towards saying 
these sorts of processes are key to starting donation and that also gives us key information about the types of intervention for non-donors to get them started and warm glow is a process that maintains high cost cooperation particularly when that's towards a stranger so where reciprocity or inclusive fitness are not mechanisms that can be operating to keep people donating and again that tells us then the types of intervention that can be used for blood donors in that context. So by way of conclusion, I hope that across this presentation I've been able to show, demonstrate to you that by studying blood and organ donor behaviour, we are able to understand something more fundamental about the nature of human cooperation, as well as understanding something about the cooperators themselves. And that this research has entered the benefit of both donors and transfusion services in terms of understanding better ways to recruit and retain donors and to manage the donor experience which leads to an increase in the amount of blood available and blood products, which is obviously to the benefit of the patients and recipients of blood and blood products. And I think also we can show that the study of blood and organ donation behaviour allows us also to feed back to the wider academic community about greater understanding of the nature of human cooperation. And finally, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all the people over the years who I've collaborated with and learned so much from about blood and organ donation. Without their support, I would not have been able to do any of the, the research that um, I've reported on today. So I've listed here everybody that I've worked with over the years. And apologies for anybody I've forgotten to list here. It really is my error if I have and anybody I've not mentioned in the talk today. Um, thank everybody and if anybody is interested in any of the work I've talked about today please do get in contact with me and I'll be more than happy to talk to you about the work and or send you copies of um, papers. Thank you very much.